Okay, let us turn to the book of Daniel, please. Thank you for joining us. May God bless your heart and your soul. My text is taken from the book of Daniel, chapter 6, reading at verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home to his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times a day. He prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Shall we pray? Father, I pray that you will bless this session, anoint the speaker, the hearers, and the readers. We give you all the glory in advance. We pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name. Everybody say, Amen. Now, how do you look at this book? Do you find this book easy or hard to understand? If you ask me, I would say both. Because on one hand, it can be very easy to understand. On the other hand, it can be very hard to understand. Take for example, from chapter 1 to chapter 6, it is a section very easy to understand. We have stories like Daniel in the lion's den, the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. Who will not understand that? Even children in the Sunday school knows about it. But on the other hand, when you come to chapter 7 to chapter 12, it is the section that is very hard to understand. Even scholars Bible students for centuries have wrestled with it in order to understand them. So with that in mind, let us look at the introduction. First of all, let us consider the person. The person. Who was this man called Daniel? How much do you know about him? Do you know he could be an Yuna. Yes, an Yuna. That is my own opinion and deduction only. You may ask me, how do I come to that conclusion? It is all because of Daniel 1 servant. It says here, the king entrusted Daniel and his three friends to the chief of the Yuna. My question is, why? Why entrusted these four of them to the chief of the eunuch? The answer is simple. To make them eunuch so that they can serve in a king's court. Well, that is only my opinion only. If you disagree, it is fine. So, point one, the person. Point two, the purpose. What is the book of Daniel? All about what is it trying to aim at if you ask me it can sum up in four simple words God rules the world God rules the world yes God is in charge of everything that transpire in this world it is like playing chess you know it is like you playing chess with a world-class chess champion. Who will win in the end? Of course, everybody will say that man will sure win. Well, you're free to move, to make any move you wish. He doesn't control you. But every move you did, every move you take, he will counter at it with another move. So true enough, in the end, he won the game. That is exactly what happened when I said, God rules the world. This is where the sovereignty and the responsibility of man 
comes in. The sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man comes in. On one hand, you can have men do whatever they want, even the devil. But God will still fulfill his will and his purpose on earth. Well, man may try to change history, so will the devil. But in the end, God will still shape history according to his plan and his will. That is what we are going to see in this book called Daniel. So the person, the purpose, lastly, in the introduction, let us look at the third point called the partition. Do you know this book of 12 chapters? It can be nicely divided into two equal halves each. With one side, the first six chapters from chapter 1 to chapter 6, that concerns the historical, the past. Then the other section, the last six chapters of the book, from chapter 7 to chapter 12, that concerns the prophetical. That is the future. So, my outline is very simple. Only two points. The historical. Point number two, the prophetical. Let us take the first point first. The historical, chapter 1 to chapter 6. First point, Daniel's dedication, chapter 1. Here in these chapters, we will introduce straight away to these four men, Daniel and his three friends. They were all trained and equipped to serve in the king's court as Yuna. Their names were changed according to Daniel 1 verse 7. Daniel didn't object to that. However, when they were asked to eat the king's food, which involves eating unclean animals like pig, Daniel make a stand that he purposed within himself that he would not defile himself with a king's foot. That is found in Daniel 1 verse 8. So the proposal was made that vegetables and water be given to them for 10 days. Then at the end of the 10 days, they came and tested them. And guess what? They found out that their appearance were not only looks better, but also their understanding and wisdom on all matters were 10 times better than all those taking the king's food. So there is a principle right here that we can learn. Never, never compromise God's standard as far as his word is concerned. So if we make a stand for God in the small, small issues of life, you will be able to make a bigger stand for him in days to come. That's Daniel chapter 1. Now come to chapter 2. Point number 2. Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Nebuchadnezzar's dream. In this second chapter, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And he dreamed and he saw there was a huge image, a monster statue, if you like. The description is given to us at Daniel chapter 2, verse 32 and 33. There's a head of gold, a chest and arms of silver, a belly and tight of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. Now, if you take time to look at the chart which I post to you in the apps, you will be able to understand better. The head represents the Babylonian kingdom. The chest and the arm represent the Middle Persian kingdom. Belly and the type represent the Grecian kingdom under the Alexander the Great. The legs of iron represent the Romans kingdom and the feet with the iron and clay mixed together that represent the futuristic 
the forthcoming 10 revised Roman Empire. Now, all this represent the five world empire that will dominate and rule over this entire world. Thus far, four already fulfilled. That's one and the last one. That's a feet with the iron and clay mixed together. That is yet to come. Notice carefully, the material used here, the material used here, from head to the feet, deteriorates as it goes along. The grandeur, the glory, and the value also declines as it goes. From gold to silver, silver to bronze, bronze to iron, eventually iron to iron and clay mixed together. Are you falling? So if you ask me today, where are we now in God's time clock? Well, we are right at the feet, the ten toes, where the what iron and clay mixed together. That speaks of the ten nations that is going to come, the last world empire that is going to rule over this world. At the moment, the good news is, it is still in the formation stage. Not yet come to come to the surface yet. But one day, this kingdom, then revised Roman Empire, is going to come to this world. One day, it will come. Now, in this dream, Nebuchadnezzar's dream didn't just end there. Because in Daniel 2, verse 34, verse 35, it continued to say that there was a stone. And I want you to take note of that. Let's look at chapter 2, verse 34 and 35. He says, you watch while a stone, please take note of that, a stone was cut out without hands, we struck the image on his feet of iron and clay and brought them and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone and the stone that struck the image became a great became a great mountain and filled the earth. Now you ask yourself, what did God use to destroy all the world empires in this world? The answer is simple, a stone. You ask yourself, what can one small stone do? Am I right? You can't build anything with just a stone. True or not? So a stone here represents something that is the weakest and the most insignificant thing of all material that have been used here. Am I right or wrong? Now what value can a stone be when it is compared with gold, silver, bronze, iron or even clay? I mean, a stone has no value at all. Who will buy a stone? Who will actually sell a stone? And how much will you pay for a stone? And do you know who this stone was? It is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Was this not Jesus came for? He came like a stone in his first coming. Is it not true? He, though he was God, he emptied himself, he stooped and condescended himself and became a man and took on the form of a servant. That was how low Jesus went to in order to save you and I. Note, what will happen when this stone comes again the second time? He will no more come as a savior. But this time, according to the scripture here, he's going to come as a king of kings 
and the Lord of Lords and he's going to strike the image right at his feet and all world empire is going to come tumbling down in the end. Can you see the might of God here? The power of God? He only need to use one small tiny stone, the weakest of all materials, to defeat the strongest that is in this world. And after defeating all of them, then Christ will set up a kingdom that will never, never be destroyed and it will fill the whole earth. Now that is Daniel chapter 2. Now come to Daniel chapter 3, point 3, fiery furnace. In Daniel 3, 1, we see Nebuchadnezzar erected a huge image of gold, probably because of the dream that he saw in the previous chapter. It was 90 feet tall, and nine feet wide and he issued an order when the bands play everybody had to bow if not you will face the fiery furnace it is either bow or burn guess what only three didn't obey didn't comply and all these three were bound in hands and feet thrown alive into the fiery furnace. Then, miracle happened. To the surprise of the king, as he peeped right through the mouth of the furnace, he noticed that there were four men inside. The fourth one looked like the son of God. This is found in Daniel 3, verse 25. Observe the miracle. Just in case you say that the fire wasn't real. It was a real fire. It burned all the men that threw the three Hebrew children inside. Do you know that? And that fire also burned the ropes that tied them. But it didn't touch them or burn any parts of their body, inclusive their clothes, their shoe, and even their hair. And the smell of the fire was not even on them. And according to verse 26, the last sentence, they came out from the middle, from the midst of the fire. Imagine that, untouched, unscratched, and unharmed. All glory be to him. Now that is Daniel chapter 3. Now come to Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar insanity. Nebuchadnezzar insanity. In chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar was given a dream again. This time he saw a big tree. A big tree. Towering right to the sky, touches even the heavens. The leaves were beautiful, the fruits abundant, a lot of animals and birds found shelter in it. Then he saw another vision. This time he saw a man, a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven with a loud voice. What did he say? Chop down the tree. Chop down the tree. Cut it down. And strip off all its leaves and fruits. And let animals, the birds, be scattered from it. But the voice said, Leave the stump. Let the roots be in the earth. Oh, that is the mercy of God. The mercy of God. And he says, let seven times, it means seven years, pass over him until this man recognize the Most High, rule in the kingdoms of men and give it to whomever he wills. 
Well, that was the message of warning given by God to this man. But did this man give heed to the warning? The answer is no. Because a year later, he was walking in the, on the roof of his palace and he said within himself, as he looked at the kingdom, he said, wow, the kingdom that I made with my hands. And while he said it with his, with his words, and words were still on his lips, the judgment of God fell on this man. And true enough, he became insane. He became like an animal. He was driven out from his palace right to the field. And he started to eat grass like the rest of the animals did. His body was wet with the dew of heaven and hair, his hair begins to grow like that of an eagle's feather. His nails was like the bird claws until the seven years have finished. And at the end of the seven years, he lifted up his head, looked towards the heaven, and he acknowledged God. And you know the story, everything was restored back to him and he continued to be king of Babylon. Now that is Daniel chapter 4. Now come to Daniel chapter 5.5, Belsazar Feast. Belsazar Feast. Here, King Belsazar began to throw a feast and he made the greatest mistake in his life. And that was he meddled with the holy things of God. He ordered his men to take out all the holy utensils of the temple in Jerusalem to be used in his party. That very night, he saw a big hand appear out of nowhere and with the fingers begins to write on the wall with his words. Many, many Turkal Afasin, which interpreted it means you are put on the balance and you are found wanting. And that very night, the Persians came and invaded Babylon and defeated it. That was Daniel. That is Daniel chapter 5. Now come to Daniel chapter 6. Point six, Daniel in the lion's den. By the time we come to Daniel 6, Daniel was an old man serving under the new king called King Darius in the Medo Persian kingdom. No more Babylonian kingdom. Then the decree was passed that nobody is supposed to pray or bow to any god within the space of 30 days. Now, did Daniel comply? The answer is no. He continued to pray to God every day, three times a day. He will kneel before God with his windows open towards Jerusalem and he will give thanks to God. Then the news came to the king and true enough, he was thrown into the lion's den. That very night, the king couldn't sleep. The next day, he woke up very early in the morning, went to the den, and he called out to Daniel with a lamenting voice. And he said, O oh Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel replied, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. When he was taken out from the den, they examined Daniel's body. No injury was found. Now, that is Daniel chapter 6. 
So we have finished the first section of the book, that is chapter 1 to chapter 6. We have touched on the historical. Now we come to one final point, the last point, and which is called the prophetical. Chapter 7 to chapter 12. The moment you come to this second section, bear in mind the whole atmosphere changes. We are moving from the simple to the complicated. You understand? We are moving from the past event to the future event that is yet to take place. Before we go into these six chapters, to prevent you from being confused, I want to say two things first. Number one, please understand the events that happen from chapter 7 to chapter 12. They are not continuous. This means what you read in chapter 7 doesn't continue on to chapter 8 and then to chapter 9 and so and so forth. The events happen here, they are not continuous. Secondly, you need to understand that as you read these chapters, they will overlap each other. The things that mentioned here will overlap each other. Sometimes, some of them, will be repetitive, they will be identical, but put in different words and images only. Are you following? Now, with that in mind, let's look at chapter 7. The first one is the vision of the fourth of the four beasts. There are four different kinds of animals mentioned here. A lion, verse 4, a bear, verse 5, a leopard, verse 6. The fourth piece, verse 7 and verse 8. All the four animals mentioned here were identical with the big image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in Daniel chapter 2. Please refer to the diagram given in the Acts. They were all there. But look at Daniel 7 verse 7 and verse 8. Here, it says, After this I saw in the great visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, it had huge iron teeth, it devours, breaking in pieces, trembling the residue with its feet, it was different from all the other beasts that was before it, and it had Ten horns. This refers to the Roman Empire. Instead of mentioning the ten toes, now notice, notice carefully, it mentioned the ten horns. Notice carefully, and it had ten horns. And the word and conjunction telling is telling us that this empire, Roman Empire, is going to continue on from the feet to the ten toes or the ten horns mentioned here. Are you following? The ten toes mentioned in Daniel 2 verse 42, you remember, the iron and clay mixed together, the ten toes is actually the same as the ten horns mentioned here. So this is a continuation. In other words, the ten toes or the ten horns that is going to come on this earth which is called the ten nation or the ten revised Roman Empire that is going to take on this world, rule over this world in the last days. This is, this is exactly that is mentioned right here. Alright? And it says here, ten horns. Horns here, it speaks of strength as I told you before. Right? So let's look at verse 8. As I was considering the horns, there was another horn. Now bear in mind, from this 10 revised Roman Empire, 
there will be another horn, another little horn that will come out. All right? That will come out. And that little horn is none other than the Antichrist. He will use the platform of the 10 revised Roman Empire. He will use that to rule over this world. Notice carefully verse 8. There was another horn, a little one. Little means the size. Being human is little. Little one. Notice carefully, it says here, coming, coming up a man. Coming, coming means imminent. Coming is talking about the forthcoming of the Antichrist. That word coming means it's on the way. Coming up. Up means he will rise to leadership. Out from these ten nations, the ten toes or the ten horns, he's going to rise. In the midst of them, look carefully. Coming up among means in the midst of the ten nations, he's going to rise up. And notice carefully, before whom three of the first horn were plucked out by his root. That means three out of ten will be destroyed. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. Means he's a human being and a mouth given to him that speaks arrogant words if you're interested in all that right the study on antichrist uh, you can see that all in the bible is all in the bible and you can do a further study on that if you want to but time doesn't permit me to talk more on that now let's move on Chapter 7, we already finished chapter 7, the vision of the four beasts. Now we come to chapter 8, the vision of the ram and goat. In chapter 8, the ram and the goat correspond to the Middle Persian Empire and the Grecian Empire that we see in chapter 2. Now according to history, when Alexander the Great died, at the age of 31 years old, his whole empire were, was divided under his four generals. You can read that in Daniel 8 and verse 8. That's all for chapter 8. Now we move on to chapter 9, the third point. The vision of the 70 weeks. In chapter 9, we come to Daniel's 70 weeks. This is a very important study, but I don't have time to touch on it all. But I will highlight a few things here. Look at your Bible, Daniel chapter 9, from verses 24 to verses 27. Here, take note, Daniel's 70 weeks. I will break it down for you. In these 70 weeks, there are actually three parts. All you need to know is the seven weeks that is found in verse 25. Please take note, seven weeks. There's number two, 62 weeks. That is also found in verse 35, 25. Then there is a one week found in verse 27. The seven weeks talks about the decree that was going, that was going out, uh, telling the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall on the, and the temple under Ezra and Nehemiah. Right? So that's the first part. Second part, 62 weeks is the period leading towards the first coming of Christ. The period. There's about 434 years. If you take 62 times 7, that is 434 years. The period leading to the first coming of Christ. Then the one week is the seven years. Seven weeks is the 49 years. So the one week refers to the seven years great tribulation period that's going to happen, that's going to happen in the days to come. Or people call it the Jacob's trouble that is found in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. 
Now, so here we have the seven weeks, 62 weeks and one week. Seven week and 62 week is already in the past. The one week found in verse 27 is still yet in the futuristic form. Bear in mind, between these two periods, between these two events, that is the seven weeks plus the 62 weeks, then make up of 69 weeks. This refer to the past. It's already happened. Okay, just before the first, just before the first coming of Christ. That already the past, already happened. Now, the one week is still yet in the future. That will happen before the second coming of Christ. So the event, the seven weeks plus the 62 weeks, will happen before the first coming of Christ. The one week will happen before the second coming of Christ. And between these two periods is what we call the church age. So between these two periods of 69 weeks, and the 70th week, the last week, between these two periods, is a big, big gap, which is about 2,000 years. We call it the church age. Are you following? If you really cannot understand, just look at the diagram, which I sent to you in the apps. From there, you'll be able to understand further. That's chapter 9. Now come to chapter 10. Chapter 10, point number 4, is the vision of the heavenly visitors. Vision of the heavenly visitors. In chapter 10, we see the period between the Middle Persian Kingdom Empire was about to, to be taken over by the Grecian Empire under the Alexander the Great. So the transition of power was about to take place on earth and that is found in chapter 10. And it explained to us how the demonic forces were involved in the heavenly realms working behind those kingdoms. Are you following? And mind you, behind every earthly kingdoms, there is a demonic prince behind it. You can read that in chapter 10, verse 20. And every time you see the earthly battles happen on the earth, especially in the Middle East, you must understand this is a reflection of a spiritual battle that's going on up there in the heavenly realm. I hope you can understand that. That is chapter 10. Now come to chapter 10. 11. Chapter 11 is about, is about the prophecy on nations. Prophecy on nations. In this chapter 11, it is a prediction of what is going to happen, the thing that is going to happen just before the first coming of Christ. In this chapter, it only has 45 verses, but it has 135, 135 prediction and to the astonishment of all Bible scholars, every single one of them came true. Now in this chapter 11, there was one man that was not given to us by name, but we know through history, he was none other than Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes. This is found in chapter 11, verse 28 to verse 32. Guess what? His nature, his intention, his behavior were all identical to that of the Antichrist. Kindly note, the time of each of their arrival, Antichrist Epiphanes came on the scene before the first coming of Christ. In the same way, the Antichrist will come on the scene one day 
just before the second coming of Christ. Why we were given chapter 11 is to tell us what is yet to come. And that is chapter 11. Now we come to chapter 12, the six points, the last chapter of the book of Daniel. It is about what? The prophecy on Israel. So we have the vision of the four beasts, vision of the ram and horn, vision of the 70 weeks, vision of the heavenly visitors, prophecy on nations. Last chapter, chapter 12, is on prophecy on Israel. In chapter 12, it put emphasis on the 70th week. Remember I told you? In chapter 9, about the 70 weeks, this one is the last week, the 70th week. So you have uh, seven weeks, then you have the, how many weeks? You have the second one is called 62 weeks. 62 plus 7 is 69. That is already taken place. All right. So now we come to the last week. Mentioned in Daniel 9 verse 27. So we are coming to that week. So when you come to chapter 12, we are coming to the end of that one week. You call it the seven years great tribulation period. And we are going to read Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. And after that, we are going to end. Look at chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stand, watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble. That is talking about the seven years tribulation. Such as was since. There was a nation, even to that time. So it's going to be a terrible seven years, great tribulation period for the Jews and also for the world. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. So God promised the de deliverance. Everyone who is found written in the book. Verse 2. And many of those who sleep. So verse 2, it talks about futuristic. It talks about the day of reckoning. It talks about what is going to take place in heaven. And those who sleep means those who die in the dust of the earth shall awake. There will be a resurrection. Some will go into resurrection to eternal life. Some to shame and to everlasting contempt. Then verse 3. Challenge all of us. There will be a day of reckoning. There will be a day of judgment at verse 2. Verse 1 is talking about the great tribulation period that is going to come on this earth just before the second coming of Christ. Verse 3, it challenged all of us to be so winner, to be wise. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the star forever and ever. This is what and this is how the book encourage all of us, especially in this year and in the years to come, that we should be people that are of the wise, that we should be used and allow God to use all of us to be great soul winners for Him in the last day. May God make you to be His soul winner. May you be wise when you come to his kingdom. May God use all of us for his glory. Shall we pray? Father, this morning, I thank you for this book. I thank you for the people who listen to this simple message on this book of Daniel. May your blessing rest upon each of them. Prosper each one of us. Make each one of us to be great soul winners for you in the days to come. We give you all the glory, all the praise. In Jesus' wonderful name, we all pray. Amen.
and Amen.